Thank you for being back to the festival. And uh, we had the chance to, to see again this incredible film, My Beautiful Laundrette. <laughs> and I think it's a very good point of uh, discussion to see how the thing changed or not in England from this time. Well, they got worse. They got worse. <laughs> yes. But soon we will leave Europe and then we'll be okay. <laughs> Things have got worse. What do you think, Bella? It seems like an age of innocence watching that in a way because it's like breakthroughs were being made that I never imagined would be reversed and now we're seeing everything going back to a time but with the knowledge that things were much better. So it seems almost magical now watching that. Yeah, I think it, it was some, like you say, some innocence, some hope, something even with all the, the these difficult ways of living. But anyway, and um, and I think there there is something in the, in the, but the, the country is conscious of that. Of that, the people are conscious that the things are going worse and worse. People were would do. There is no more almost. Uh, work, uh, working class exist again uh, still, or what, what's going on? Well, it's all changed because of this ridiculous business of leaving the European Union. <coughs> I mean, it, it, the, the differences have, have become completely different. So, um, but it all seems very, very... I mean, I imagine if you support leaving Europe or if you support the Conservatives, you're very happy and you think the country is wonderful. I think it'll be an absolute catastrophe. I'm not sure that there is that feeling of happiness there. That's the problem, is that no one seems to be happy and it seems chaotic. And so the whole thing to do with working class, it's all about division and class doesn't even, you know, the whole idea of um, supporting people in communities which sounds like a very old-fashioned concept, but that seems to be being destroyed by creating like ad adversarial situation that doesn't seem to connect to anything. Like the people who are voting for Brexit are just as unhappy as the people who don't want Brexit. But this, this, how this sentiment of leaving Europe could be better for them uh, maybe because they expected much more from Europe that they had at, at, uh, when they were inside. And uh, there is something that comes from Thatcher or just... Uh, I, don't think, <coughs> I don't think anyone had any expectations from Europe except that we've done very well by being in the European Union. And it brought a much more interesting culture, a, a multicultural, multicultural country was much more interesting. Now they just want to be Americans, I guess. But you know that the, even in Europe, the, this, this sentiment, this racism, is uh, as well, you know, taking place more and more, more strong every day. You know, these, uh, this something is not only in England, something is happening even interior of Europe. Well, except that the people they want to get rid of are Europeans. They're not Africans or Indians. Yeah. They're Polish people, or indeed Portuguese people, or Romanians. It's, it's just this peculiar hostility that they think is the source of all their troubles, but of course it isn't. And um, in t I'm in sorry, we, we, this, this talk of this miserable country. No, no, <laughs> just to know, just to have an idea, you know, how the, because sometimes we in Europe, you know, uh, we don't understand very well uh, why it's so you know, the, the country is so, in a, in a kind of so divided, so we don't understand anything what's going on, you know, because from one, the, uh, apart the Conservative Party, on the rest, you know, the Labour is divided in two, you know, the Scottish wants to stay, the other ones, uh, you know, uh, they want, there is a kind of, uh, we feel that nobody really understands what's going on. I don't, think, going I don't think anybody does. I mean, I don't think Boris Johnson does. Nobody does, because part of it is a sort of imperial nostalgia. They, you know, they want the country that they lived in during the war. 
Well, it was terrible. I was alive then. It was, you know, you wouldn't want to live like that anymore. But that's what they talk about the whole time, going back to the, the way it was during the war. If they could bring Churchill back to life, that's what they would do. <laughs> this is not a good position for a country to be in. And in terms of, uh, um, you know, for you, uh, you know, that uh, in uh, what in uh, artists and uh, culture and creative, what are the difficulties that you think that uh, you you will have more, or or you can still think that even with all these things, uh, in battling inside, you can you don't have any you know, particular reason of thinking that it will change a lot in the, for example, in the uh, producing films and uh, making all these things are going to change or not, not being in Europe? You mean, you mean for the better? I don't see why. I mean, the truth is when we... When no, we no, made... for the better, no. If, I don't think it will be better, but do you think, do you imagine what are the kind of faces of pro other problems that can come? If you know the Brexit, for you a Brexit is, a, is you think is not going back. I think it's going back. Yes, I think it's a disaster. No, but you don't think that they. Uh, you think that the Brexit is going to exist, or it's a, it's going to it be a reality. It'll exist in about two months' time. Well, we will officially withdraw from the European Union, and then we will spend ten years negotiating a free trade agreement. So the idea that it will end very quickly is nonsense. But what I remember about this film, this film was the, I think, was, was a very, it was the first act of defiance against Thatcher. I can remember the, the woman who owned the cinemas where it was playing, and she would say, oh, people really like the anti-Thatcher jokes. And it was the first film, I think I'm right, which, which sort of challenged which made fun of, of Mrs. Thatcher. And then this whole ironic thing of Mrs. Thatcher being supported by immigrants. That was very comic at the time. I mean, it's now completely different, but um, it, it was like um, flying the flag. I mean, it was, it was raising a, a flag of defiance. And so maybe someone will do that again. Did you start your anti-Brexit uh, first film? No, 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 no. <laughs> Not yet? <laughs> he writes anti-Brexit novels. Uh, yes? Yeah. 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 <laughs> he wrote an anti-Brexit novel. But the, the, you know that defiance will come, but at the moment everyone is sort of defeated. But also, apparently there's... 1.3 million new voters have registered just this week, and yeah. they're all 18-year-olds. So no one really knows what they're going to do. So that's the hope that... that things will change. Maybe the Brexit... They Brexit. know what, what they want, whereas we're all just shell-shocked by this kind of catastrophic situation that seems to be led by people who don't know where they're going. And I think that's profoundly demoralizing. And everyone just is going around in tiny circles, <clears throat> not really knowing where to go, because there's no obvious direction. But may, it, it seems, if all these young people have v registered, they obviously know they want to make some form of protest change. And we don't know how they're going to do it. This is a new genre of protest. And uh, that's, that's really encouraging. Um, you know, hope. And, and they all look like Daniel Day-Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Any, it, one thing, you, and you think in the, uh, uh, for you anyway, like in established direct and everything, the things for your work is not going to change a lot, you think, you know, with the... I, I, don't, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know. The films I make are paid for by the French, and I don't know if that'll go on or it'll stop or what. I've no idea. Will there be co-productions? I don't know. I mean, we're all much more paid for by the Americans than we were. 
No American paid for this film. No American paid for it. They bought it, but they didn't pay for it. But for example, these films were made by, you know, without even co-production, I think. No, this was English, English television. television. Mm. That you think that's going, will go on? Or it's no, you, more difficult to You do can't that. afford to now. You can't, af you can't afford to make a film in Britain that is just paid for with, as it were, British money. You have to go, and you end up going to America, you end up going to Netflix or Amazon or whatever it is. Everybody ends up there. This is very, very depressing. <laughs> Not depressing. You should talk about Dan Day Lewis, that's much more yeah. fun. <laughs> yes, do. In the, this film was from a, uh, Anif Qureshi, uh novel that... Uh, uh, script, here is an original. It's, it's an original mm. script, mm. you made. And um, you, you work with, it's the first time he work, was working with you. Yes. So yeah. It was not yet a, a famous novelist that is now. No. Now. He was very, very obscure. And, <laughs> and uh, we lifted him out of obscurity in terms. How did you find him? He turned up and put the script through my letterbox. And I had the grace to say, this is very, very good. We should make this now. He let you the, in the mailbox the script? Well, I got a phone call saying, this, bo this boy wants to get a script to you. I said, fine. So he put it through the letterbox and ran away. And then uh, I read it and said, well, this is very, very good. I mean, it was, it was a wonderful script. Which I, I think he got an Oscar nomination, so you know, I was I was very lucky. And uh, Daniel De Lewis, how do you find him? <laughs> we had a list of four actors: Tim Roth, Gary Oldman, Ken Branagh, and Dan. And at that time, they were all no. Gary, Gary Oldman made a lot of uh, theatre before. Yeah, the, they were all they were all good actors, yes. but they were all waiting. Now they're all in Hollywood, <laughs> so it was easy. And Dan, the girls all said, "No, no, no, you want Dan, you want Dan," because he was so pretty. <laughs> and is that when you started your Friday morning salon, which no, was no, how no, I... that was years later. <laughs> Will you, will you um, tell us about how that started? Because that's how I got to meet you. I heard about this salon. I'd met you before, but I'd heard about this salon. This is salon. embarrassing. Yeah. No, it's Hanif Karish, she goes to a psychoanalyst who lived near where I lived. And we used to meet for coffee. And it then was, everyone heard and about it. people started it. turning up. Yeah. Like me. Yeah. <laughs> to that coffee restaurant? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you met him like that? I, More or less. Yeah, I met him. I heard that there was a salon on Friday morning, which sounded like something from the 19th century, and I thought, I've got to go. So I found out where it was and pretended I'd just walked in. And then I came every Friday for, for many years and um, listened to the conversation. And, uh, you know, if anything can, I think, get people through difficult time, time is listening to exchange of, of ideas, however kind of old-fashioned that sounds, I found that very um, interesting and I learned a lot and, um, and it was very funny and they had this brilliant conversation and... Um, As you see. <laughs> it was... Uh, anyway, well, Daniel never, Dan, Dan De Lewis never came, but members of the Pink Floyd come, so it's very, very chic. And just, now we have to restart when the Brexit arrives. You know, we have to do these, these things. No, we'll just go on. We're so conservative, we wouldn't, we wouldn't know what else to do. <laughs> it's shocking. It was 30 years ago, this film. Yeah. And it was, you know, now what, what I felt that, in that, that in, uh, at that moment we could be, uh, the films could exist fast. Now you have to wait, a, even you, I think, you have to wait a little bit to, before when you have a, 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 an idea, a project, and to shoot and everything. This film, when you decided to do it, it was very fast afterwards, no? Yeah, but that was just to do with that the money fell into place. And actually, if you, if <laughs> this film was, I was much older than anybody else, but there were a lot of young people who then became very successful, like Dan. So everything was waiting 
And then this film came along, and that was the one that released a lot of energy. And you think in England it's possible as well, even for young people to have this kind of... Uh, well, you can't tell because it's, it's waiting to happen. I mean, it, it happened in Nouvelle Vague in France. It happens every, all over the place, but um, this is just what happened in England. Now? But it requires some young person to have some... You know. I mean, Hanif, it was about his childhood, really. He was at school. And he had a friend, a white friend, and one day he came in with his head shaved and had become a skinhead. And then there was a, um, somebody got killed. I remember there were demonstrations against the police. It was a very political time. And now again, it's a political time. But somebody will have a good idea because that's what always happens. Maybe your son. Your son, yeah. Mm. My son, yes. It's a, it's a great difference, you know. I see how he believes still a lot in things. He, can, he think he can change things. He's working all day and everything. That's now they die. They, our time is to see them. <laughs> yeah. If you look at, you, at, at your old career uh, and, and you single out this film, you know, what, 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 what does it mean to you? You don't. You don't. This film changed the lives, changed my life, changed Dan's life, changed the producer's life, changed Hanif's life. It just changed all our lives. Nobody had, nobody had ever made a television film that became an international success. It was just phenomenal. Um, and it, it was a time, we made it in such innocence. And then suddenly it was playing in Paris and Barcelona and the other side of the world and America. So it changed everything. So it's very hard to think beyond that. It also, in my case, sort of politicized me and taught me an enormous amount. So it makes me feel very, very old. <laughs> did, did it change anything in Britain? Did it change people's minds? The film has changed anything in Britain? Well, five years later, we got rid of Thatcher. <laughs> But it took five years. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know. I've no idea. I've no idea. But it, the truth is that nobody knew about the Pakistani middle class. That was, and so people became better informed about their own country. And I could see that it was the white working class kids who somehow they had it worse than anybody. And they all grew up to, to vote for Brexit. So, you, you, you know, you can see everything in there. But it was also the, ed, the, 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 the Pakistanis were really the end of the empire. Now it's the imperial connection is sort of gone. And um, immigrants now aren't, aren't um, relics of the empire. Because a friend of mine who was uh, living in Britain, she is a Portuguese and she went to work there, she tells me that uh, people are against immigrants. Uh, so the British people are against immigrants and she understands, she realizes that it has to do with their uh, attitude um, to Brexit. So they, would, uh, they think that the open uh, frontiers allows people to come in in great numbers to Britain. They are mostly against Polish uh, immigrants. So I wonder if... Uh, I, I have a house at the moment that is being renovated by Polish workers who are wonderful. The truth is that the, particularly the builders from Poland are much better than the British ones or plumbers or whatever it is. So it's sort of jealousy and rage that the Europeans come in and take the jobs that British people would like or the British people were too, you know, the National Health Service is staffed with people from other countries because, the, because British people wouldn't clean up and wouldn't do the work. Britain has done so well out of immigrants. I mean, our prosperity comes from there. You know, our workforce was very limited. People were brought in from Jamaica to drive buses because nobody in Britain would drive buses. So it's an absolutely ridiculous argument. You know, we should be on our knees with gratitude to immigrants. I think it's just, you know, they are, 
is this kind of fears are so irrational, they are completely not understandable. You know, I had the chance of living in London when I was 21 for two years and that was, you know, I can get jobs. I didn't. I, I didn't have any papers. I couldn't get. I could get jobs, small jobs all the time. I could leave my, you know, adolescence there without anything. If you see the about the Polish workers, you have to see Moonlighting over Jerzy Skolimowski. It's a film about yes, and and all these. You know, there is. There was what you think. Uh, everybody knew that they need the other one. Now I think they think because they are living in the poorest way that in the, in the past that the fault is the other ones. But the, the problem is they they live really poor, but not not in in England. All over the world, the social difference are better. You know, I think the the Thatcher is was not only a problem in England; it was a problem all over the world, all over Europe. Because these uh, theories of neoliberalism, liberalism, they are there. You see what's going on in Europe, and it's the same. And um, that's why. But Europe, don't let us do more stupid things. That's the, the only advantage, you know. And I think, uh, and it's completely ridiculous that you know uh, now uh, to see someone thinking that going out is making better that if they stay and solve their problems together. It's ridiculous. It's so we need your sympathy. <laughs> well, uh, first I want to thank Mr. Paul Branco for everything he has done uh, for not only the Portuguese but the European cinema by producing, showing, uh, creating festivals and um, promoting meetings with directors we love and admire. Thank you for that. And then that's, um, only, that's the only thing I I I, I know it. to do because no, I, I, I don't know how to direct a movie. Well. You know? Thank you. <laughs> and then um, it's a huge conversation we would have about Brexit and social um, system and uh, what is unfair. You focused on two points. I got two points in the movie that are greed and uh, money. And I think uh, workers. Uh, at least nowadays, are living miserable conditions, really do. And they like, for instance, in Lisbon, to go to 15 kilometers from Lisbon, where, where they can afford houses, it takes one hour and a half. So it means that poor have to be far away and rich, well, rich or wealthy people. And I think that's not people from abroad, not uh, unemployment. The huge uh, issue is in fact, well, maybe it's silly to think about it, it's a little utopic, but I think uh, we should focus on giving better conditions to people and kill this huge difference. It's like the worker gets 1,000 less than the, the boss. Well, maybe it's idealistic. And then, uh, Mr. Frias, I'd like to thank you for, um, you don't make movies, you make monuments. Uh, you don't make movies, you make monuments that people like to visit. Um, like, um, I'd say like an artistic object, but also like an entertaining place. And uh, entertainment and um, art, it's a rare combination that you, you, you can multiply in your prolific and successful career. So thank you very much for that. Thank you for <laughs> for this event and for this classic. Uh, the, uh, as, uh, in in these days in the eighties, when there was no the, when the hate was not coming through the internet, maybe by mail. Uh, since you mentioned Thatcher uh, uh, by her name and everything, uh, what kind of like eighties uh, classic hater style? Uh, I don't know, maybe right wing people. Uh, supporters uh, have. have uh, did, did you uh, get any any ha hate response in the day? And do you think if you would made make something like this today, you would get like loads of the haters? Not only organic haters, but Steve Bannon's bots and whatnot. 
the, what, what did you get at the time, and do you think it would be even harsher if you made a direct reference to a person like Boris Johnson, for example, in these days? I think you will write a, a Twitter. <laughs> yeah. You will write you a Twitter, yeah. Boris Johnson. <laughs> Boris. <laughs> Yeah, did you get a lot of hate mail, like hate mail or no, something in the day? It wasn't like that in those days. Well, there was no internet, so there was no anonymous yeah. correspondence. Of course, but uh, in the media that were available, did you get a lot of Wild uh, ne negative responses? No. Wild enthusiasm. Great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> they were I don't all in remember. The I don't remember any. I don't remember being criticized. Right. Okay. These days it would be different, right? Maybe. I imagine. Yes. I mean, now you say it. <laughs> but I'm very, very old, and I don't follow Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky you. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. I don't follow it. Considering that uh, UK is a democratic country, and considering that Thatcher was so bad, why she won elections for 15 years, and considering that Brexit for sure is also uh, so bad, why it has so many supporters? Why does Brexit have so many supporters? Yes, and why Thatcher won 15 years of elections? She was elected for 15 years. I mean, four elections, I suppose, or three or something like that. I, I think Britain is a very, very conservative country. I mean, it it's mainly has a conservative government. Every now and then there is a Labour government. And even then, Blair was very towards Thatcher. So I can't answer. That's, that's just the evidence of the voting. Even if it destroys itself, even if those options destroys itself for the future, that seems to be exactly what is happening now. Um, you know, there is no, uh, the, there is no explanation for why poor working class people support Brexit because they will be poorer. Yeah. So it it isn't the economy stupid; it's something else. It's the politics too. Well, it's sentimentality, isn't it? It's a sort of. I mean, clearly something has gone wrong, and clearly they have been dispossessed and not listened to for many years, but uh, I don't think Brexit's going to solve their problem. And I don't, I mean, Boris Johnson, he's too intelligent not to know that. He must know that, that it's heading for a disaster. But they've sort of got on that road and they can't get off it, just as we can't get off it. So that's why the whole thing is such a catastrophe. So turkeys are voting for Christmas or whatever they're supposed not. <laughs> turkeys yes. at Christmas, we eat turkeys. Yes. Turkeys are voting for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> but it is daft. And, may, and the more, you know, because there's an election going at the moment, the more, the worse things Boris Johnson says, the more popular he becomes. I have no idea why. Probably people are confusing politics with show, with show business. Yes, and they, the, the Labour leader they don't like. He's very unpopular. So if Tony Blair came back, he would be voted in. He, people would love it if Tony Blair reappeared. Except you. Well, I would be very un <laughs> confused. <laughs> okay. Any any other questions? Yes, just I would add that this period will uh, turn into a film by you. So Listen, I don't want to make a film about Brexit. It uh, <laughs> could go maybe, crazy. Maybe maybe about maybe body. in ten years' time. Maybe about Boris Johnson, you make a few no, points. No, 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 no. Too sad. <laughs> Maybe in ten years, in ten years' time. Ten years. Good. Okay. You, what you are finishing now? You are finishing a film. What? You are finishing a film. A TV I film. now make these mini series. Yeah. <coughs> I'm finishing a mini series about um, the man who is alleged to have cheated on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. You have that in Portugal? Uh, what? Who wants to be a millionaire? You have that here? Yeah. Don't tell me it was popular. <laughs> so a man cheated on it and apparently won a million, but he didn't ever got the money. So I'm making a film about that. And we learn how to cheat it and get the money or not? I don't know if he's guilty or innocent. I haven't a clue, but it was a very good story. 
Uh, I don't know. Let me go all the way back to Gumshoe. And what? Why did you have such a you know such a break between Gumshoe and correct me if I'm wrong, the hit? Like between movies, why did you take such a long break from from cinema? Because I was learning how to make films. Thank you. <laughs> and so I was largely, I mean, I was entirely working in television. The films I was asked to make were silly. I mean, ridiculous. But in television, I started doing good work. And I, become one, I became one of the people who did the good films in television. So it was a very, very good education. And, you know, we were all, I mean, Ken Loach was doing it and Mike Lee was. So we were all doing films in television and learning our jobs. And when you look at Gumshoe right now, what do you see? You <laughs> Oh, I think it's rather prophetic. I don't think I've changed for a minute. Gumshoe was a brilliant script written by a friend of mine and um, very funny and very... Um, it was like a sort of portrait of himself. I think it's a terrific film. I was really pleased when I saw it. Do we still uh, accept someone that wants to, that you don't know for everywhere, anywhere, to propose you a script and to read it, to lose time reading or not losing time? I depend entirely on scripts being brought to me, so why would I say no to anybody? You read a lot of scripts. I read a lot of scripts, but I'm, an en I'm entirely passive. <laughs> I sit at home by my letterbox and scripts come through. Yeah? <laughs> no other way. And, um, and there is other... Uh, films that started like that, script that you get, got from a known... Dangerous people. Liaisons. It was like this as well? Yeah, yeah. came through the letterbox. The Queen, well the Queen was, there had been a previous film about Tony Blair, came through the letterbox. They all come through, I mean I don't know any other way. In other words, I, I don't develop, I don't walk around with films in my head or with books I want to turn into films. Even something like Europe, for example? Came through the letterbox. I'm, Filomena, what? Filomena? Yep. Yep. Absolutely. And then I go to work and then they change and develop, but basically they sent me half the script. Good evening, Mr. Fierce. By the way, thank you for Filomena. My mother's Alzheimer's and one of the last film that I saw with her when she was in, when she was fine, was that movie. She liked it a lot. Filomena. I remember. Filomena. Yes. So well, she was probably Catholic, your mother. She is, yes, right. <laughs> of course she is. Uh, uh, Mr. Frears, uh, last week I, was, I saw a movie which is one out of three of the final selection movies uh, that, uh, that goes to an award by the European Union, which awards three, uh, one film each year. Uh, the three films, uh, I saw the one from Spain, which is about some corruption plot within a party. Uh, and there was another film about the genre discrimination in a former Yugoslavian country. And the third one, I don't remember now what it was. But the thing is that I was thinking that maybe, and that's what I wanted to ask you, uh, if do you think that uh, European cinema is in depth or, uh, of showing and releasing more films uh, pretty much directed to this phenomena of these years of segregational um, areas with the countries as say Catalonia, uh, many other places in, in Europe, uh, a little bit also the Brexit, the Brexit stuff, that uh, are European cinema needing to release more widespread, more visceral stuff about this phenomena of segregation? Our European cinema in depth, what would you like to see nowadays? Well, I, don't, I don't actually know the films you're talking about, but I can see that, that the range is narrowed. I mean, the Americans now only make superhero films. So and that seems to me a big disappointment. What was always nice was the range of films. There were so many films about so many subjects, but nobody does that anymore. It's very difficult to be original. I mean, if I flatter myself, it's that when the script of My Beautiful Laundrette turned up, 
I said, this is very, very good. Or when Philomena turned up, this is very, very good. Or when the Queen turned up, this is very, very good. It's very hard to find original stories, original subjects to make films about, okay. which is what you're really, and the lack of originality is very, very depressing. But there are still good films. The film about the two popes is wonderful, about Francis and yeah, yeah. Ratzinger. It's yeah. very, very good. So there are people trying to find different, you know, trying to make different films. But at the end, Mr. Pierce, do you think that uh, cinema is still like the, the media, like the tool no. to get people conscious about everything? No. When it, I was... Does it have the same impact as 30 years ago? No. When I was young, this, for, for 20 or 30 years, the cinema was the center of people's lives. I remember being at university and the great Italians, uh, um, um, Antonioni and Fellini and Visconti, Visconti yeah. they were making films in Bergamo. I mean, I, it was wonderful when I was young. The Nouvelle Vague was happening and films were central to your life and you learned how to live from there and indeed from the American cinema. So cinema was very, very important. And watching Vim Vendor's film last night, I remembered how important cinema and Vim, you can see, was formed by that period. I don't think that exists anymore. No, I think it's gone. All young people want to do is go to Hollywood, get the money. Everything changed. Nothing yes. is the, so the way we live. That that, and it's not better or worse. It, it's different. We were the cinema was the, completely mm. in the center of. Mm. When we discover, you know, we just have to live with, and uh, uh, now it's other things. It's different. I don't know. Mm. It's not. Uh, it's not for me to criticize in my, my point of view or not. The young we generation will discover other things, other ways to, to find their way. That's all. We were the children of Jean Renoir. Right? Yeah. I remember Bertolucci. We were the children of Jean Renoir. And yeah. now they, that's all gone. Nobody knows who Jean Renoir was. <laughs> Don't grow old. <laughs> Okay, but we don't re we don't regret. What? We don't regret to be the children of Jean Renoir. No, it was magnificent, <laughs> but it's over. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Now they should all go to church. Huh? They should all go to church. Huh? <laughs> thank you. <laughs>